Everyone has had the exact same experience in life. We all played Chrono Trigger on an emulator because none of us owned Super Nintendos. And in doing so, we all fell in love with Frog. Slurp cut. So I get it. I really do. I understand why so many people are invested in the rivet. But I have to say, I've been spending several years sculpting little mushroom guys. So you know what? Don't sleep on the fun grill. They're not just fungi. They're fun guys. Okay, so that was the little intro skit. Uh, this next part is just my personal impressions of the Dagger Heart playtest. So uh, this is going to be for like a hundred people <laughs> who are interested, and the rest of you can use this opportunity to click dislike and then click off the video. Thank you. A tabletop RPG consists of both systems and narrative. When you rely too much on systems, then you have what I personally refer to as the Puffin Forest issue. Even if I disagreed with him, if the DM didn't want me to change, I shouldn't have tried to force his hand by being suicidal. I still want to play with a group, and it's not my game. It's, it's their game, and it's not my place to try and sabotage it. Anyway, that's my story. Stop it! Just stop it! It's not my game, because it's supposed to be a collaborative system based on the mechanics. And your place in the game is secondary to the mechanics. Oof. Not ideal. You need a healer because the 5e system somewhat rewards people who have a balanced party. But that kind of thinking just leaves you lost in the sauce, as the kids say. It's always been my opinion that it's much more interesting to use mechanics in a way that the player character naturally falls into than to be solely invested in systems that are optimum. The trap of optimum thinking is what a lot of YouTubers have fallen into today and sadly leads down the path to the loathsome munchkin. So systems can be an issue if you focus too much on systems. So is Daggerheart a solution to this? No! A lot of people are confusing rules light with a system like this playtest which is narrative rules heavy. And when you rely too much on narrative, that's when you fall into what I'm referring to as the dagger heart issue. So let's talk about dice. Anyone familiar with the fantasy flight game of Star Wars RPG is already familiar with the points system based on dice rolls. The players get points, and then the GM gets the points, and the narrative shifts depending on the whim of the dice to some level. On page 105 of the playtest of Daggerheart, for example, if you fail a lockpick, it's not just that the door doesn't open on a failure with hope. It might mean that you can hear the rumble of footsteps coming down the hallway behind you. The enemies you narrowly escaped before are getting close. On a failure with fear, the door might be magically warded to keep thieves away, call, causing an arcane alarm to trigger. This also applies to a success with fear, where you might succeed in unlocking the door, but opening it reveals an enemy you didn't know was guarding it. These consequences are what make the game interesting and drive forward the adventure you're all on together. Two things. I despise narrative systems where things suddenly happen based on dice rolls. Improv is fine, but the GM should have already decided if there was an enemy behind that door. The door should have already been magically warded or not. You would think that this sort of preparation is over preparation and that this style is easier. No. This playtest actually creates more work for a GM, possibly rolling four different outcomes every single dice roll the players makes. You don't have to do that, but the rules clearly imply that this is the preferred method of working with the uh, fear and hope system. So with four different outcomes, you have to realize that players love making rolls that the GM doesn't know that they're going to make. So that leads to literally at any point in the game, four different things possibly happened 
that the GM kind of has to keep track of, which some people would be able to do. But I, do I think the vast majority of GMs I have experienced in my life would be able to keep up with a system like that? Not really. <laughs> Consequences should always come from player decision, not a role. If the players unlock the door without being sneaky and checking it somehow, or looking under the door and seeing if they could see through a crack or something like that, that should matter. Or maybe a player kicks down the door and runs in surprising an enemy. In both of those scenarios, the optimum engagement would happen when it was the player character's actions that are driving the action forward. Not because a D12 landed on a certain number. Activating enemies' abilities is also somewhat under the control of the dice as well. Players do stuff, and every time they do stuff, every roll allows the GM to do stuff. But some of the stuff requires fear. And fear is mostly generated when a player rolls a certain way. If the players roll well enough, then there's just less fear is going to be generated. Now, of course, if you roll well in a game like 5e, obviously, that's going to make the encounters much easier as well. But the mechanical abilities of the enemies, which can change the course of a battle dramatically, those are never uh, attached to how a player character rolls. I know that they want to make every dice roll like super important, but this system... I think is really going to lead to some issues if someone just rolls really well. And they might get used to super easy battles, and then suddenly there's going to be an encounter where someone rolls really badly for the entire encounter, and then it's just going to be super difficult. Because again, the playtest stresses that the GM should always be using fear. The GM has the ability to exchange points for fear, and vice versa. It still seems like the framework of this is going to be completely different depending on what the dice roll is, and I'm just not personally a fan of that. I would like a hard encounter to be a hard encounter. I don't want a hard encounter to be a super hard encounter just because the players rolled terribly for a couple rounds. Now, of course, you could say, well, that this is why the GM has the ability to use fear dice in a certain way. But again, that's putting more work on the GM, and I thought the big complaint that everybody had about 5e is that there was a ton of work being put upon the GM. So again, I don't know exactly what niche this uh, playtest is fulfilling with these rules. Uh, the issue of who gets to go when is addressed in the quick start adventure when a roll directly results in enemies attacking first. Boy. That kind of combat order sure makes sense to me. Kind of makes you wish there was some sort of ordered system for all combat in this game, actually. Again, I'm going to be honest, I don't have that much experience with uh, systems that aren't specifically ordered in some sort of mechanical way. So, I, I just don't... You can tell the players that they can't hog the spotlight... But if there's nothing mechanically stopping some players from hogging the spotlight, that they're going to hog the spotlight. But again, I think this would work out great if you had a certain types of players, but more on that later. Side nitpick, tokens! This game uses tokens. This playtest uses tokens to add your trait bonus to a roll. So instead of like 5e where it's like just plus two, you actually put a token in your hand and you drop it on the table and that reminds you to add plus two. So whatever the tokens are, are gonna get rolled with the dice. I found that extra stuff around the table leads to issues with players paying less attention to the actual game. Uh, maybe this rule was made just for people who are dice goblins who like collecting random crap to bring with them. Uh, I can see so many issues with rolling extra stuff cocked dice, just more shit on the table, and, and not enough table stuff for, like, the stuff that actually matters, like terrain or miniatures, because these, this tabletop game is supposed to be tabletop. Just adding extra stuff to roll along with the dice just seems like a pain in the ass. It, even in games where, like, you are specifically kind of uh, 
taught to do this like Warhammer 2nd Edition where you rolled a ton of dice. You rolled percentage dice. That's only like maybe like four dice total. And in this, you could be rolling like seven dice with tokens, possibly. So that's just, it's just a lot of stuff. And I don't like stuff. I don't like extraneous stuff. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. Just just use use your brain. You can you can use your brain to look at your sheet and know numbers, add on to that. Side nitpick in this playtest quick start adventure, a battle map is always considered a separate thing and only comes out when there's a battle. This is a personal thing for me and in my games, but having some sort of basic map from almost everything seems to be optimum for my game. Um it allows players to always think about what they could be doing in terms of mechanics. I absolutely hate the idea of different sections of the game for skills in battle. Well, that reminds me of something. Players should always feel like anything is a possibility. If you relegate the maps for battle only, then that leads to the sort of game where the players lose self-determination. It's kind of like why I like maps for dungeon crawls, because then everything else is mapped out. There's no separation of play space. The separation of play space is a wonderful bit of artificial drama for something like a streaming game, where it's like, oh, we're bringing out the battle map. It's There's going to be a battle happening. But for a home game, it's it's it seems like it'd be just an overall negative for me. Uh, ditto for the action tracker. Uh, I wanted my players to assume a fight can break out at any time, or more importantly, they can decide uh, to start a combat or use their combat abilities at any time. Having this around seems oddly limiting for a game, at least the games that I like to run. Another thing that raises player engagement is the game being an actual game. Stakes for the player's decisions to mean something. That means the possibility of losing. Page 9 of the playtest, there is no winning or losing in Daggerheart in the traditional gaming sense. If the players do careless things, then most or all of their characters will be destroyed in my games. If they work together, then things will go their way, and they can progress in the manner they choose. That's what I found to create real engagement and make things more exciting and fun for everybody around my table. Matt Mercer, despite the many allegations of running an overly narrative game, always did a decent job of balancing systems and narratives in his own games that I've seen him stream. In fact, with the stuff that I've watched, he always seems to have solid 5e mechanics in his game, which led to fast combat and enjoyable listening experiences. And that's another reason why 5e is so popular. Its systems are easy to understand, and even somebody who doesn't play the game, once they listen to somebody play it for a little bit, they'll start to get it immediately. They'll start to pick it up. So would this be my choice? of a game to run in a place like a public library or with a bunch of new players. No! <laughs> if I had to play with a bunch of people that I know that are good at improv, yeah, I mean, maybe this could possibly be a perfect game. Good luck finding a table of those, and if you do find one, hold on to them dearly. A lot of people on Twitter are claiming that you should not make a game with jerks in mind. But what if everybody at the table is incapable of working in a group and respecting each other's time? More rules won't help with that. Rules are not a magical panacea, but they do help different people work together and be on the same wavelength. Should you make a game with rules designed for jerks and people who can't work together? Should you make a game for flawed people? Do you know anybody who's not flawed? Do you know anybody who really wants to play tabletop games who isn't a flawed person in some manner? Jesus knew that we are all flawed. And he has cooler hair than Matt Mercer ever will. And yes, you should make game mechanics in mind for flawed people, because we're all flawed. Do I need to show you the closet filled with narrative games that hardly anybody has ever heard of? Do I need to do that? Because I'll do it.
Don't fucking press me. I'll do it. Frankly, what this game is, is a mishmash of random rules. Mostly narrative-based, but then pulled from... Some people have already recognized where some of these mechanics have come from. 4E mechanics. 4E. 4E, no! 4E! Some people are confused as to why I am so negative towards 4E. Frankly, it was my first edition of D&D. And possibly the worst tabletop experience that I've ever dealt with. So while my personal negativity towards 4E stuff may seem harsh, it doesn't come from a place of ignorance. I owned almost all of the 4E books. And I wasted hundreds of hours trying to play and enjoy it. And yes, Daggerheart has decided to bring back some of the worst mechanics that 4E has tried to foist upon the tabletop community. Tried and failed, by the way, because nobody likes them. Not just me, but the vast majority of players don't like 4E. <laughs> the choice was made. It's not Pepsi versus Coke. 5E is super popular, and 4E is re relegated to, like, a few weird GMs who like certain aspects of the game. And I'm very disappointed that apparently a couple of those weird GMs uh, worked on this system. Minions and combat-purposed monsters. <laughs> I hate the entire concept of this. It's artificial. Monsters should be statted and act upon some logical system based on attributes and not solely based on what they do in combat. Combat-focused monsters are a reductionary system. You, you lose all flavor and purpose of the monsters outside of battle, and it's just, it's just really sad. This playtest brought back the concept of minions. I hate minions. Uh, a truly stupid way to pad gameplay. Uh, I could literally rant for an entire video about how dumb this concept is. You just want to give a power fantasy. All you want to do is give the power fantasy of just cleaving through a room of enemies. This whole minion thing is probably why uh, every once in a while I'll get some player who just runs into a group of enemies and then just gets bodied in 5e. Because they're used to being like, oh, if it's a big group of enemies, then their purpose is for me as the player to go in there and kill them all because they all have one hit point because it's a big group of enemies. And in 5e, that's not true. A big group of enemies is going to fucking body you almost every time. Because there's, they're not there for you just to kill. It's a big group of enemies that is a danger and an obstacle. And you actually have to come up with some sort of tactical idea of how to deal with that group of enemies. Yeah, in 4e, they could just wipe out that group of enemies. In vanilla 5e, it's incredibly risky and a stupid thing to do. The, con the conceptual need of having to come up with a creative solution or a tactical solution to deal with a large group of enemies is absent when the mere idea of minions exist in the mechanics. A group of enemies is automatically to be considered, this is meant to be killed, and there's no other purpose for them. They are just there to be annoyances or fodder. In my mind, there should always be some sort of reason why there's a large group of enemies there that is outside the scope of combat mechanics. A reason for a large group of enemies should never be because they go down in one hit. The cards, oh, the... Oh, the cards, oh, the cards. Remember when I was complaining about extra shit on your table? Back in 4E, the cards were only there to emulate the powers of World of Warcraft. That was their purpose. Cool down, click, cool down, click. The cards were incredibly distracting to most players as I sat there and looked at the table. There is no reason to bring this back. This does not solve a problem. The cards are kind of there to emulate Magic the Gathering, which I can kind of see. <laughs> but some of the uh, power cards seem to be functionally like the 4E ones, and thus bad. Bad. The 4E elements uh, leave such a bad taste in my mouth that it would probably be easier just for me to translate some of the elements into another game system rather than try to adapt Dagger Heart as it stands now. Uh, the Session Zero, I personally think the Session Zero is generally one that was a uh, response to the early beginnings of 5e where for some reason everybody was starting games at third level. Um, 
it's it's a good idea to do so. However, if you're running games for say a public library program or a program that's in a game st shop or a program that you're just saying, hey guys, meet here and play D and D, you're you're really not going to have time for a session zero. People come there to play D and D, so you want your game to be beginner friendly and to have a nice introduction to the game. Uh, and you want to have as much communication as possible as before. So most of the Session Zero stuff, I like to handle communication before the game happens. Because when the game is happening, we are there to play D&D, full-on D&D. And with 5e, it's very easy for people to start understanding the basic concepts as soon as they sit down and start playing in my games. The best way to learn D&D is to play D&D. That's, that's my personal opinion. That's what I've seen to be correct over the years, etc. Uh, so the ideas laid out in this playtest are... Uh, are for an incredibly narrative-focused game where everybody around the table has a bunch of input that they want to provide. Incredibly strong character choices are great, but the best characters I've played were ones informed by how I ended up interacting with the rest of the people around the table. Systems actually help games be inclusive, so a bad DM will inevitably be a less terrible DM when constrained by rules. Consider how Matt Mercer originally became a dungeon master. It happened because he understood some of the core rules in D&D, and he had a bad DM who was running the loathsome DM PC. So Matt Mercer started his own game where he wanted to run the game right, within the mechanics. In 5e specifically, the rules specifically say that a DM PC should never be happening in the first place. So. A player familiar with the rules will immediately suss out what's happening. Daggerheart, on the other hand, seems to place quite a bit of a leeway on how GMs utilize every mechanic in the game. A bad GM might inevitably become an even worse GM with the amount of freedom that Daggerheart instills within them. A bad GM within the rules of this playtest could quickly become an insufferable GM. Anyways, uh, I'm not going to keep on talking about this playtest. It's already been way too long. Daggerheart is certainly interesting. Uh, and in the past, I've had a lot of fun running the Star Wars RPG with the light and dark side points. There are a lot of good things in here that are good reminders for anybody, and I think everybody should take a chance to at least read through the playtest because there there is good stuff in here. Page 170, that took me by surprise. How about a quick 10-minute break while I think about how this exciting change will play out? That is a great reminder. I've been in several scenarios over the years where my meticulous framework of a game did not stand up to the stupidity of the players. I've always rolled with the punches, but sometimes it's good to take a second and consider what might be the best course uh, when a player decides to fully grasp their player agency and go to town. Will I get a chance to run this system? I honestly don't know. I need to look for. Uh, I need to look towards the needs of my players. And generally speaking, the system, as it stands in this playtest, does not meet those needs. I mostly run games for uh, three groups of people: strangers, new players, and then people who are heavily invested in a systems-based game like Five E. In my opinion, focusing on the systems is the best way to foster an interest in tabletop games with new players. Then, if they want to move on to the more narrative-focused stuff, then that should actually be easier than jumping in the deep end with something like this. You hate to say that, like, oh, somebody actually needs to take a couple improv courses <laughs> before they'd be able to get the most out of Daggerheart, but... It kind of seems like somebody would have to take a, at least a couple one-on-one -on -one improv courses before they can get the most out of Daggerheart. And not everybody's going to do that. Sad to say. The golden rule means that I can leave all of this stuff that I didn't like in the playtest behind and see if the next iteration is going to be an improvement or not. Also, as a quick final side note, who the fuck punishes people for getting a snack? Who the fuck punishes people if they need to take a break during the game? This is common courtesy shit. Like, it is... I, I know there's, like, um... There's there's always gonna be horror stories, um... In D&D &D and other tabletop games. There's always gonna be horror stories of somebody just being incredibly inconsiderate and not cool. 
And in those cases, I think that's more of a thing like, okay, well, I don't want to play tabletop games with this person anymore. Because that's literally, this is like kindergarten stuff. Have common courtesy towards other people. Understand their needs. Understand that not everybody can sit at a table for three hours at a time and just never get up and get a snack. It's crazy. Like, they call that an open door policy. I always thought open door and, and tabletop meant that your game was going to be uh, accessible for anybody who wanted to stop in and, and play real quick. That's generally what I always thought it is. But this whole idea of the open door meaning is like people can get up and go to the bathroom or go grab something to drink and the GM isn't going to punish them. It's like, I, I don't know if I've ever heard personally of that happening. I'm sure that maybe it does, but holy crap, dude. Dude, if you run a game with somebody who has no courtesy at all, then just cut your losses and quit it. I mean, just quit. God damn. People have no humanity left anymore. That's crazy. It's crazy shit, dude. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, boy, huh. Maybe I'll do a thing where I actually try to play dagger heart with a bunch of random people that'd be fun but uh honestly i might wait for the next iteration of the playtest because goddamn uh it's tough dude it's tough i don't really enjoy i really don't enjoy a lot of the mechanics especially the 4e stuff i don't enjoy it at all it seems weird like none of the monsters in the adventure had the weird like 4e uh monster like rules or monster uh combat purpose stuff so it's weird. It's like, it definitely seems like two different people wrote those. So I don't know. I mean, I love, ah, fuck, whatever. I'm done. See ya.